Hello, friends. We are excited that our No Small Endeavor Plus community is growing. Now, all of our friends in the No Small Endeavor orbit are intelligent, smarter than average, winsome, good looking, while the members of NSC Plus seem especially so because they are enjoying ad free episodes as well as special subscriber only content once a month where we discuss habits and practices learned from our guests over the years. And those special episodes have been a lot of fun, personal and practical. I love sitting down with our producer, Jacob Lewis, and recording those for you. And so we would love to have you join us. And your NSC Plus membership helps support the show. So because of all of these things, we'd love for you to join the NSC Plus family. Just go to nosmallendeavor.com, click subscribe, and start catching up on our subscriber-only episodes today. Again, go now, nosmallendeavor.com, click subscribe, and start catching up. See you there. I'm Lee Camp. This is No Small Endeavor, exploring what it means to live a good life. You're listening to one of our best of episodes with psychologist and best-selling author Angela Duckworth. The new year traditionally gives us opportunity to reflect upon the year past and the year ahead. For many years now, I found it helpful to look back upon the past year with two lenses. First, simply that of gratitude, cataloging various gifts received, relationships enjoyed, experiences savored. And second, a list of lessons learned to keep them handy for reference for years ahead. Then, in looking at the year ahead, I focus not on resolutions, but on habits and projects I think make sense for me to take on in the new year. Resolutions, of course, famously and typically come to nothing. But making a decision to develop a new habit, which has not always come to fruition, but very often it has, that's a sort of meta decision. That is, I've found that a new constructive habit brings all manner of other constructive goods in its wake. Enter then one consideration for you for the new year. A decision to develop a meta habit, a habit that will bring other such helpful gifts in its wake. Today, the meta habit of grit. Hello friends, Lee C. Camp. You're listening to No Small Endeavor. This is our unabridged interview with Angela Duckworth author of the New York Times bestseller, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. If you listen to our show very much, you've heard me riff on things like the cardinal virtues, courage, prudence, temperance, and justice. And this is one of the reasons I love getting to teach ethics classes is because in the classic tradition, you'd have to talk about these practices, these so-called virtues, these habits or dispositions, skills. The cardinal virtues were thought of as the sort of indispensable skills to try to live any life worth living. And it's a very complex, uh, perhaps complex is not the right word, better, finely nuanced discussion of habits and practices. Courage, for example, is related to the passion of fear and navigating fear. And so the question is, does one have too much fear or too little fear? And courage is located in the middle. So every, every virtue gets related to typically uh, a vice of deficiency and a vice of excess. So one might be overly fearful and thus be a coward or insufficiently attend to fear and then be foolhardy. But courage is the skill, the capacity, the disposition to be able to navigate one's fear in a way that leads you toward a given goal, what one thinks is good or true or right or beautiful. And so similarly with Angela Duckworth, when we talk talk about perseverance or grit, you'll see that it's a multifaceted, nuanced conversation, that it's not simply just saying, I think I can, I think I can, though that's part of it, but it is more multifaceted and just a fascinating conversation. So I'm delighted to get to share this interview with you. Enjoy. Again, it's Angela Duckworth, author of the New York Times bestseller, Grit. Angela Duckworth is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania, faculty co-director of the Penn Horton Behavior Change for Good Initiative, and faculty co-director of Horton People Analytics, a 2013 MacArthur Fellow, also known as the MacArthur Genius Grant recipient. Angela has advised the U.S. Department of Education, the World Bank, NBA and NFL teams and Fortune 500 CEOs. She completed her undergraduate degree in advanced studies neurobiology at Harvard, her master's with distinction in neuroscience at Oxford, 
and her PhD in psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. She's also the founder of Character Lab, a nonprofit that advances scientific insights to help kids thrive. Today, at least initially, we're discussing her number one New York Times bestseller, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance. Welcome, Angela. Lee, I'm very happy to be in conversation with you. Yeah, same here. I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you for a long time. I've known of your work for a long time and uh, grateful for the time to get to be with you today. Uh, Har- Harvard professor Daniel, Daniel Gilbert has said, psychologists have spent decades searching for the secret of success, but Duckworth is the one who found it. <laughs> Quite an endorsement. D- Dan, and, Dan and is that's... prone to colorful language. I just yeah, yeah, want you yeah. to know that. <laughs> but So that secret is? Well, I don't want to overplay the significance of my work, but I do study the characteristics of high achievers, and I have found that a common denominator of people who achieve excellence, whether the excellence is in an athletic sport or something um, intellectual or artistic, that the common denominator that I've been studying is grit, the combination of passion and perseverance for very long-term and personally meaningful goals. Hmm. You you began early in your career doing a study. I remember reading about a study at West Point that kind of began to help you begin to formulate that. Would you describe that for us in the way you began to formulate the, the research questions that have driven you? You know, when I got to graduate school, I didn't really know how to begin with this question of what is, you know, what is what is what is true of high achievers across these different domains? Um, so I started interviewing, you know, people who had, you know, been decorated with honors and awards for their accomplishments, and that, uh, of course, led me to like the well, I don't say a course, but that led me to conceptualize grit, but to actually get a handle on what it did or didn't predict. Uh, one of my earliest studies, and I was, I think, maybe a second year PhD mm. student, um, so still pretty much a rookie. Um, I, I was introduced to the generals at West Point. That's the oldest military academy in the United States um, and provides something on the order of like one in four uh, or maybe one in five officers into uh, the U.S. Army. And and that really is, I think, the mission of West Point, right? To provide uh, leadership for the U.S. Um, military and army in particular. So these generals have, for more than half a century, asked the question: Why do some of these extraordinary young people who get admitted through an incredibly like fine mesh sieve? You know, it's 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 so hard to get into West Point. Top grades, top test scores, uh, recommendation from a congressman or a senator. You know, why do so many of them drop out um, even before they've had a chance really to to see what West Point is, um, meaning the very early days of training, um, and maybe even to see whether like they can make it there. Um, mm-hmm. And so when I was introduced to these generals by my PhD advisor. Marty Seligman, who um, had himself done some research at West Point, uh, we, we devised a very simple study, which is to give the grit scale. These are questions that uh, really, I guess, uh, they kind of were the boiled down essence of what I had been learning in these interviews, you know, these descriptions of being a hard worker, of finishing what you begin and then also this kind of sustained passion that's the that's the maybe less obvious half mm. of grit you know having a consistency in your goals and in your interests over time. Well, we gave the grit scale, gosh, it must take, you know, less than a minute to take the full grit scale. And these cadets took that as part of a big battery of questions and tests. Um, The very beginning of West Point, the second day of their first summer. Um, And then we just waited around to see what the data would Hmm. tell us about who did well and who persisted. And the the finding that really, um, I think, confirmed that I was at least, you know, on some kind of path uh, to understanding something about high achievers was that grit was a better predictor of staying at West Point during the highest attrition periods in particular, but overall it also predicts just graduating in four years, staying in the army after that. Um, It was a better predictor, especially during the high attrition periods, than measures of talent. Um, And West Point had two of those. So they had a measure of cognitive talent, you know, your standardized mm-hmm. test scores, and then also your physical talent, um, a battery of physical tests like running mm-hmm. and sit-ups. So, so I guess to summarize, you know, as a, as a 
beginning academic with this intuition that there must be something that that athletes and artists and you know leaders and um, civic activists who are very successful that they that they all have in common um, and and you know to give it a name grit um, and then the West Point study was um, one of the most um, definitive but also the earliest study I had done uh, trying to test the hypothesis that grit matters for high achievement, um, especially when those high achievements are really hard. Yeah. Uh, Very briefly, uh, any other kind of studies or case studies that really stand out to you in the intervening years that, that point again to the significance of this? Well, I I, I want to um, say yes, uh, but you know, so the yes part is like sure we've studied grit in sales, uh, grit in uh, predicting graduating from large U.S. urban school districts where dropouts mm. are um, unfortunately very common in high school. Um, you know, grit predicting, you know, who will win the spelling bee, the national spelling bee. Huh. Um, and there have been other studies. So that's the yes. And, you know, these um, other studies that I mentioned, uh, you know, confirm the early study at West Point. The but is, you know, I think when a lot of scientists got interested in grit, they they did easier studies, honestly, you know, like studying West Point over years and studying the national Mm -hmm. spelling bee and then waiting to see who wins and recruiting like samples of salespeople. It's actually really hard. The easier thing is just to give um, students, like say college students, the grit scale and just see how it correlates with their grade point average. Um, And I want to say that those easier studies to me, I think are not really what I started studying grit for. I don't think grit is the best predictor of like, you know, flossing your teeth or, you know, (laughs) eating vegetables or like doing your homework when you don't feel like it, because those are not extremely challenging, long-term, personally meaningful goals. So the yes is, yeah, there have been other studies, not just by me, but, but, um, but I did mention some that, that I feel are, um, important highlights, you know, since the West Point uh, study was originally done. But the but is that I think, I think there's a a boundary condition that I want to point out, like a grit is, I think, a common denominator of, of elite achievers across fields. But if you ask me, is it like, the very best predictor of like all goals, you know, doing your taxes, flossing your teeth, et cetera. I would say that the everyday self control goals that I also study um, are, you know, that, that's not so much about grit, but, but by, Mm. by other, but you know, that's, that maybe that's another conversation. Yeah. 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 Very helpful. So I want to go back to the contrast between the comparison or uh, contrast comparison between grit and talent. Uh, And you of course talk about talent and the significance of talent, but um, you suggest that effort is perhaps twice as important as talent. And, and you have this, um, provocative phrase, helpful phrase, I think, the mundanity of excellence. So to unpack some of that for us. Well, let's start with that um, beautiful phrase, the mundanity of excellence. And I want to say uh, that I love that phrase and it's not mine. Yeah. So that's the yeah. um, that's the wordsmithing. That's the expression of Dan Chambliss, who's a sociologist uh, whom I adore and recently mm. retired from Hamilton College. Um, Dan grew up as a swimmer. Um, at least he, you know, swam a lot. He didn't go to the Olympics. Um, he uh, was a uh, Then, you know, later a sociologist who decided that he would embed himself, you know, in this kind of like, um, you know, tradition in sociology that's kind of become a little passe, but I think is so beautiful and valuable. He he just lived with these teams, you know, kind of like an anthropologist would, you know, live in another culture. Um, And he spent time with elite teams, you know, Olympic hopefuls and also, you know, club teams like, you know, the kids who just live around the the block and they happen to swim at the neighborhood pool. And what he came to observe about um, swimming in particular, but, you know, excellence in general um, is that, you know, people think when they see somebody who's like a Katie Ledecky, right. That, that, you know, that they must have a gift, like they must, they must have, I don't know, like super long arms and, you know, like really flexible feet and, um, you know, like a weird heart and, you know, just, you know, all of these things that come together that make them qualitatively different than the rest of us. The expression, the mundanity of excellence was his summary um, conclusion, which is that, you know what it is, you know, a lot of it, at least, you know, he's not saying that there are no genetics, there's nothing to say about talent, innate talent, but, um, but that the mundanity of excellence is like, thousands of hours in the pool working on, you know, your technique again. And, and by the way, um, 
uh, you know, when I was um, uh, researching the book, I I had a conversation with Rowdy Gaines, who was, mm. you know, gold medalist swimmer. He was like, do you know what it's like to jump into a freezing cold pool and the sun hasn't even come up and you're wearing a Speedo <laughs> and, you, you know, you're exhausted and like, and then just to swim, you know, hard enough that you want to throw up if you don't throw up, like, it's like, and then to do it again. And then to do it again, huh. and now now you got to work on this elbow. Now you have to work on that, and and so I think the mundanity of excellence is a beautiful phrase that to me is beyond swimming. Um, and and uh, and at the same time, I want to say like you know these swimmers, including Rowdy Gaines and I think Katie Ledecky, like it's it's not drudgery. So so that the mundanity there is also I think hiding a kind of love. You know, like there's mm. there's a real. Um, devotion in a voluntary sense you know it's mm. it's not uh, a chore totally but it is hard so that's what the phrase um means the mundane of excellence yeah. is this observation and um in terms of talent then i think um you know the story i want to tell is one that happened yesterday i'm sitting um at a table with a gentleman who has two kids and um one of them is very good at math and he came home one day and he said to his dad like well if i can get an a you know with just 2 hours of work like why would i put in 4 you know in other words like if you're talented like i don't know maybe you should reduce your effort because you're just trying to get to some threshold you yeah. know, and so the faster you get there, the the sooner you can relax. It's like the tortoise and the hare. You know, if you're if you're the hare, I guess you could just like run a little bit and you know maybe like chill out. Um, and and what I said to this father um, is is this. You know, when I hear um, interviews, you know, I don't know every high achiever. You know, so just like everyone else, like I'll watch videos of interviews with people like Michael Jordan. Um, or Kobe Bryant, or, you know, Lindsey Vaughn. Um, uh, uh, Lindsey Vaughn, I do know, so I can say a little bit more um, authoritatively. Uh, but, but just watching videos of these other high achievers, what's really remarkable about outliers is that they don't have the mentality of trying to reach a threshold. They're not like, mm. well, I can do it in two hours. Why put in four? You know, a Michael Jordan, a Lindsey Vaughn, a Katie Ledecky, you know, these are people who say, wow, I'm pretty good at this. You know, look how far I can get in two hours. I wonder what would happen if I put in four, right? Mm. So they're not trying to get to some watermark. They're trying to see how far they can go. Yeah. Um, and anyway, that to me is maybe the fundamental distinction uh, between talent and effort. Talent is how easily things come to you. Effort is how long and how hard you're willing to work with it. And the data that have been collected, not by um, just my lab, but by many other labs around the world using lots of different ways of getting at the question, um, measures of innate talent and measures of effort tend not to be um, at all the same thing. The correlation is zero, um, sometimes negative, um, but in, in the data that I'm familiar with, like never strongly positive. Yeah. So let, let's talk a bit about, about passion then. Um, I remember reading a piece in the New York Times. I went back and looked up the title because uh, it's so provocative. It says, why find your passion is such terrible advice. And um, and that resonates with things I've heard from, for example, Nashville singer-songwriters talking to young Nashville singer-songwriters wh when they basically say, stop thinking in terms of if you don't feel excited, then you shouldn't work. But instead, you go work and you put in the work. And your notion of passion clearly includes all of that. Uh, so would you kind of unpack the way your sense of passion is quite different than this this kind of willy-nilly notion of I'm going to feel excited about what it is that I'm doing? You know, passion is both a uh, great word. I mean, I chose it to be the, you know, the complement to perseverance when I talk about what grit is. It's passion and perseverance for long-term goals. It's also a terrifying word. You know, I took a walk this morning. Um, I don't think he'll mind my saying his name with a just a, just, just a lovely uh, young man. He's still in high school. His name is David Gabay. And um, we were walking around my neighborhood neighborhood. And, um, you know, we were talking about um, psychology, which is something he's interested in. And he asked me for advice. And he said, you know, is your advice for me to follow my passion? Um, and I said, you know, David, this word, this word that I love, but sometimes hate, um, you know, I don't know how useful it is to talk to you at your age uh, about, you know, following your passion. Um, and frankly, even with people who are a lot older than you, you know, those who have 
a passion and can say it out loud, really don't need me or anyone else to tell them to follow it. Like they're fine following it. They they probably wouldn't um, not follow it if you told them not to follow it. So so <laughs> so that's that group, and that's a minority, a, a tiny number of people, and those who are are struggling to figure out, you know, what they could wake up in the morning and feel that conviction in their heart about like, well, then if you say to those people, follow your passion, I mean, you know, uh, I think they could be paralyzed in a way by that um, turn of phrase. So I said, maybe a more helpful way of thinking about this, David, um, is the word interest. And maybe even more tactical would be, you know, what gives you energy? And this is how I um, explain it to the students in my own a class when I when I teach um, undergraduates, you know, you could make a list of things, um, you know, two lists on the left side of a piece of paper. You could list all the things in your day that give you energy. You know, after you do them, you feel more excited. You know, more um, uh, alive. Um, for me, that would be reading, um, and you know, whether it's scientific articles like poetry, um, anything by Ann Patchett. Um, Mm. uh, uh, You know, for other people, it's other things. You know, music is on the left side of this piece of paper of like things that can be energy for some. It's not for me, um, except for Taylor Swift. But, you know, mostly (laughs) I'm I'm not a music file um, or whatever it's called, music a file. On the right side of this piece of paper, you might um, think about the things that sap your energy, right? After you do them, you just Oh, you're a little wilted. You're you're kind of tired. You know, for me, uh, faculty meetings. Um, uh, <laughs> yes. Right. Pre-con, yes. Pre-con. Pre-con. Amen to your professor camp. And then and then also like. Um, you know, conflict, like conflict, honestly, of any kind. Like if someone tells me, you know, I'm standing in the wrong line at the bakery, I get all, I'll ruminate about it for years. Um, that actually kind of happened to me. So, 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 you know, you've got these two lists and, and the, the key here is that what's my list, you know, on the left and my list on the right is going to be different for somebody else. And those, um, are clues, you know? And I said to this young man, David, I said, when I was your age, I took a summer school course, um, where I paid for it myself and I could choose anything I wanted. Um, and I had two choices actually, cause it was a summer session I was able to fit into. And I chose psychology and writing, nonfiction writing, just when I was your age, just as a teenager, because those things gave me energy. So why not? And so anyway, Passion is a loaded term. I yeah. love it and hate it. But the more useful term for those of us who don't feel like we know what our passion is, um, is either interest or energy. Um, mm. And then having some reflection on that, I, I, I do think, um, and I think David agreed, um, that that could be helpful. Yeah. Um, the notion, as you unpack this in your book, points to the necessity of having some ordered priorities or ordered goals of of different tiers. Uh, Can you discuss how that works out in this notion of passion? You know, one thing that I feel um, privileged by, but also I feel like responsible uh, for is to represent some of the work of other scientists that are that are not Angela Duckworth, who are the actual experts and things. So I, I just want to name that the work I'm about to describe is, um, you know, largely the work of Arie Kuglansky, um, who is a world expert on goals um, and mm. why we have them and what they do for us um, as human beings, and especially how they're organized. Um, and Arie has had students and collaborators, including Ayelet Fishbach at University of Chicago. But but the point of this uh, work on goal hierarchies, to me, and and um, and the most practical thing, I think, as it relates to grit, is that it, it's, it is human to have goals. Goals are desired future states, um, states of the world or yourself that don't yet exist, but you want to exist. That's what a goal is, full stop. Um, uh, and it is the nature of human beings to have hierarchically organized goals. So if you ask me, you know, like, why did you do that podcast interview with Lee Camp? Right. I would say, well, you know, um, I have an answer for that. Right. Which is that I believe that, you know, a conversation like this might be helpful to uh, some folks out there, especially parents, um, Mm. but but other people who are adults in the lives of of kids. And then you could say, well, why is that important to you? And I'll say, oh, well, glad you asked. Um, I actually have this idea that a psychologically wise adult in the life of every child could make the world a better place. Mm. Um, And then you could say, like, why? Right. And, And when I run out of answers for you, I'm like, I don't know, just because, right? Um, uh, Because the answer to that one is like, like, you know, I think psychological wisdom in general um, 
uh, does make the world a better place. So my goal is to increase psychological literacy. Um, mm. That's my top level goal. And then if you say why, and I kind of like, I, I, I'm sputtering, I'm pausing. Yeah. It just is. That's a top level goal. And what Arya Kuglansky and others have uh, discovered about goals is that they are organized in a hierarchical way where every time you ask why, you kind of go up a level in the hierarchy. That goal is more important. It's the master of the goal below it. And the relevance to grit is this, that you can have a more organized, um, you know, coherent, harmonious hierarchy, or you could have one that's kind of jumbled up and like, you know, mm -hmm. there's several top level goals and you're not really sure. And these goals come in conflict. And I don't know, I don't even know where this goal is. It's kind of orphaned. And that's less hierarchically, you know, well organized and yeah. and what strikes me about high achievers is the the clarity and the the harmony uh, uh, of their goal hierarchies and the homework assignment that I always give as an optional assignment to my students because it can be a little intimidating is to see if you can figure out a top level goal that you can articulate in seven words or fewer uh, that really is the one telos that gives meaning and direction and purpose to all the goals mm. in your in your life professionally yeah. let's say because let's bound it somehow and and it's optional because you know if you're nowhere close to having that kind of clarity it's an unuseful exercise um but i I have found it useful, and that's how I was yeah. able to say to you, Lee, you know, increase psychological literacy, which is even an refinement of what I would have told you five or six years ago. Yeah. Yeah, so this obviously implies uh, lots of things, but two that immediately come to mind is, is that one, it implies the capacity to say no to a lot of things or even to let certain goals go. And it also implies... Um, when to quit trying certain things, it seems to me. I, I, as I was reading your book, I, I was reminded my, my grandmother Camp, a, a dear, beautiful woman. I remember sitting on her knee um, as a as a young kid, as a you know five year old or whatever, and she would repeatedly read me the story, the children's story of the little engine that could, you know, <laughs> the the train going up the hill. I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And how that got so embedded in me. And how grateful I am for that. And then also, as I grew older, realizing there was a certain nuance or wisdom about trying to appropriate that wisdom in my life. And there were better and worse ways that I could practice. I think I can. I think I can. And there were, you know, there were certain situations where saying I think I can, I think I can actually was unhelpful. But generally speaking, the disposition that she was pointing me to has been immensely helpful. So uh, any commentary on when to say no to a goal or when to quit trying on a particular goal? You know, I don't have it at my fingertips, but Lee, I think there has been a random assignment controlled experiment where young children are either reading the little train that could, right? I think I can, I think I can, I think I yeah. can, I think I can, or another children's story and that the little kids in this experiment actually try harder on a difficult task. I'd have to, I'd have to look that up for you, but I will do that as my homework. Um, yeah. so, so <laughs> I actually do, uh, you know, believe in these, um, I'm not saying, you know, like read that, that story to your child, there'll be a different child when you, sure. when you see them the next morning, but there's a reason why we read stories like that to our yeah. children, um, as well as, you know, stories of kindness and honesty and so forth. So, um, you know, this question of, whether having some clarity about your own goals and your goal hierarchy, um, you know, does it matter? One correction that I, I have to say, I'm the first, um, uh, or this is the first time I'm, I'm saying it out loud, but I only recently discovered that a story that I said in my book, I was like, reportedly Warren Buffett, you know, <laughs> makes a list, you know, and then <laughs> like, you know, uses the following technique to like eliminate the superfluous goals, right? The lower yes. priority goals. So, um, uh, recently came to my attention that, that Warren Buffett in an interview was like, well, that sounds like a good idea, but it wasn't 
it wasn't mine, right? So I'm glad I wrote <laughs> reportedly, but still, I want to, you know, let the record be corrected. Um, I did do Warren th- call? Warren hasn't hasn't called you about that. You know, I would love to take a call from Warren yes. Buffett. Yes. Yeah, it's also <laughs> important for me to not misrepresent my friendships. Yes. I wish I were yes. friends with Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett because talk about <laughs> psychological. You know, they are really psychologically wise investors, and yes. um, uh, and I think they would both say, and they have said in print and otherwise, that having an understanding of human nature. You you know, having um, some understanding of some of the things that we're talking about here yeah. has like absolutely made them the investors that they are. Huh. But let's talk about priorities. I just want to say this, you know, I think I can, I think I can is great if you're working toward um, a realistic goal that that is a priority. You know, one of the things that's harder and harder as you become older and more uh you know, encumbered by responsibilities and commitments is figuring out what to say no to. And I, I I would say that this is a struggle of mine. You know, I used to have a rule that if you sent me an email and you were a kid, uh, meaning you were like 18 or below that I would Hmm. answer it. I mean, this is my personal rule that I would answer it personally within the 24 hours of receiving it. Oh, wow. I can't really keep up with that rule anymore. It's like, okay, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm now conflicted. So what a goal hierarchy allows you to do is at least in some principled way, make decisions. And, um, and, and I do think it helps me, you know, say like, maybe this conversation with Lee Camp will do more towards this top level goal of, you know, increasing psychological literacy, uh, in the world, um, then, you know, doing some paid talk at a, you know, company, uh, that, that wants the same amount of time. I mean, mm. I think, I think it is a compass. Um, and it doesn't mean that the compass is always going to keep you from getting lost. Um, yeah. but, but I think it's been useful for me and for other people that I've studied. Mm. So you uh, spend a large chunk of your book discussing uh, the fact that grit can grow and the four psychological traits. You've already talked about interest and that that's that's the number one uh, that you point to. Uh, You also talk about practice, purpose and hope. And I was wondering if we could maybe kind of briefly walk through those. Uh, So first on practice, you talk about this kind of commitment to continuous improvement, this persistent desire to do better. Which I always I, I, I tell my students when we do kind of virtue theory stuff that one of my favorite virtues is that of magnanimity, which at least some people define as this persistent desire to do better in all aspects of one's life. But even that again has to be bounded, right? Or you have to you have to learn to be wise about how you're going to practice magnanimity itself. Um, but talk to us then about practice, and um, and you you have Erickson's deliberate practice as a central piece in all of this. So how, how's practice central to growing in grit? One of the greatest scientists and one of the greatest people who, who ever lived was Anders Ericsson. You know, we used to joke with Anders Ericsson that he was the world expert on world experts. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't a joke because he he really was. So he was a cognitive scientist who studied the, um, the learning trajectories of people who became the best at what they did. Um, yeah. Uh, in objectively measurable terms, and then those who became, you know, pretty darn good, and then, you know, yeah. like, not as good as them. I mean, that's yeah. uh, what he spent his <laughs> entire life doing. And he coined this term, deliberate practice, which I think has been misunderstood. So I'm so um, glad to have the opportunity to clear up some of the misunderstanding of what's popularly called the 10,000 hour rule. You yeah. know, the 10,000 hour rule refers to a study, you know, one of many, but a single study of musicians at a German music academy where Anders um, was looking at three groups of musicians, you know, the very, very best, you know, those who had to have recording contracts and would become very successful professional musicians. Then the next group, um, still pretty good. I mean, it's an elite music academy. And then the final group, still pretty good, but they were uh, more likely to be, um, you know, uh, music teachers, you know, less less performers and so forth. And what he identified was, yes, in the top group, there was 10,000 hours of this kind of deliberate practice that he was, um, at the time, I think, still formulating, like what it really was. Um, but what got lost in the you know, translation of these findings for the popular uh, audiences who, of course, you know, were starving for this kind of information is that it was just a number. It was just like, oh, time on task, you know, yeah. quantity of practice. But I think the most important message of what Anders discovered in his work is that the quality of the practice is what really made those hours so important. And in particular, what he found is that the most elite musicians um, um, did more of a certain kind of practice characterized by goals right? Um, In his very last years, he was very specific. He was like, these 
goals? Like what Lee is going to work on today? Um, they, they were um, almost always, if not always, I think sometimes he say one, sometimes the other, um, were, were set by a coach or a mentor. In other words, you know, maybe you can't coach yourself. Um, like reportedly Roger Bannister, um, by his own report, you know, coached himself to the four minute um, hmm. mile. Huh. But but actually, you know, if you really look into the facts, I mean, he had a lot of people who were helpful to him, including, you know, coaches who, you know, came up with interval training and stuff like that. So so the first thing is goals. The second thing is um, complete focus or concentration um, uh, or as close to it as you can get. So typically done alone, not with you know, distracting groups of people around you. Um, so musicians playing by themselves versus in a quartet, for example, for practice um, is a meaningful distinction for Anders. And the third element was feedback, immediate and informative feedback, uh, which as a musician, you you don't need your coach in the room. You could just hear it, right? It's like, oh, mm. that was not the way I wanted to yeah. do it. I'll do it again. So in terms of grit, I have found that grit and this deliberate practice, this is joint work with Anders, um, are related. Gritty people do more deliberate practice. And um, I think the the most important thing I can say about this high quality practice is that if you understand it, um, maybe you could do more of it. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. you have to have goals. Can I like have concentration? Got to get feedback. Maybe I need a coach to help me do all these things. Like, yeah, I can, I can do more of that. And that's why I think grit can grow. Like we can reverse engineer the, the, yeah. the habits and mindsets of, of very gritty people. I, you had a, on, in that chapter, a, a brief conversation about shame that I found fascinating. Um, and I think for my own self, one of the biggest, uh, a very simple adjustment in myself, but very significant in growing and getting better at the stuff I do was when I stopped thinking about feedback in terms of fear and shame and sh fear of judgment out of my perfectionistic standards that I would put on myself or my anxiety I would put on myself and then instead shifted to start proactively seeking feedback. And that, that reframing was, I'm asking for this. I'm, you know, I, I have a sense of control about this. I'm asking for feedback. And I think that was one of the most, and I don't remember who I learned that from, but that was um, very significant. So it seems like, again, there's a lot of inner psychological work that we have to do as well with all this, right? To, to deal with our fears and anxieties, but commentary on that. I have the same perfectionist tendencies that you do, Lee. And um, uh, there's some words of wisdom from uh, a, a really great psychologist. And um, his name is Mike Gervais. And he is a, a like a high performance psychologist. He works with Olympic athletes and, um, and you know, pro uh, football teams, uh, including the Seattle Seahawks. And hmm. he has this, um, uh, you know, what he calls like the first rule of mastery is to um, not worry about what other people think. Um, huh. And he has this expression like it's FOPO, fear of other people's opinions. Um, uh. and, and I do think this um, is liberating if you can say, look, it is human nature to care about what other people right. think of us. That's not entirely a bad thing. And by the way, shame is a moral emotion. I mean, moral emotions are something you know more about than I do. But, you know, you don't want to have a child grow up without the capacity for shame. Right. That's called psychopathy. Like, you don't, yeah. that's not good. Yeah, um, yeah to but call it, someone shameless is not a compliment, right? It is not, right? Do you have any shame? I mean, you know, these are expressions that have real meaning. Um, so I don't want to discard summarily, you know, um, self-conscious emotions is the way uh, that um, some psychologists call this shame, embarrassment, guilt. Um, there's a purpose for all of those. But when it comes to improving, right, when it comes to like, hey, Angela, like maybe you could have been a little more succinct in that um, in that Q and A with Lee Camp, like, you know, yeah. maybe a couple more <laughs> stories would have been more helpful. You know, I don't know that the self-conscious emotions of like shame or frankly, you know, guilt or embarrassment are all that helpful. And if there's one metaphor that I have found helpful, um, Lee, is that, you know, when you are looking at um, a piece of artwork and you know, when you go through art school, so I mean, mom's an, an artist and um, and something is familiar to students who go through, you know, art training is what's called a crit, right? So like, you know, the class or the teacher, you know, stands and looks at your painting or your sculpture and they just have at it, right? Um, mm. And and one of the things I think just metaphorically, it's like, but you're standing next to your teacher looking at the art, 
right? So you're both looking at your painting. And yeah. I think if you can look at feedback in that way, that, you know, um, oh, in that conversation, Angela, you know, you could have been a little more succinct. It's like, okay, I'm going to stand shoulder to shoulder with Lee. We're going to look at the conversation. And Lee's going to say, I think you could have been a little more succinct there. I'm like, yeah, that's a good point. And, and over here, I could have put in another story. So I think if you can imagine yourself as separate from your performance, right. your performance is in the middle of the room. You can walk around it. Other people can walk around it with you. Right. And you can separate your ego um, and your identity from the performance or the action. Um, and that to me has been, you know, very helpful. Yeah. Third area, third psychological trait you suggest that can help us grow in grit is purpose. Uh, and you, you describe this not as any purpose, but a specific sort of purpose that is an intention to contribute to the well-being of others. You want to describe that a bit more for us? Yeah. And, you know, I, I won't apologize for footnoting all the, you know, the, the scholars here. So Bill Damon at Stanford, um, uh, among others, has been um, a pioneer in this motivation to serve others who are not you, right? And mm. sometimes it's called beyond the self purpose. Um, so indeed, I'm talking about purpose that is not like, hey, I want to make more money. Like, I want to be more famous. You know, I want to be more beautiful, yeah. but more like, hmm, you know, I wonder how I can help my neighbor or like, you know, be part of a team and the team is going to do something which is beyond me. So this beyond the self purpose is uh, something that I've studied in the context of grid. I find that it's highly correlated with being someone who is passionate and persevering for long term goals. Um, I think there's uh, a, a deep, deep causal relationship there. I mean, why would you get up, you know, at 4.30 in the morning, you know, like day after day, um, you know, to do something, you know, even performers in individual sports, right? You know, you're not yeah. talking about a basketball team, but you're talking about an individual track star right. or swimmer, you know, even when you talk to um, those individual performers, and it looks from the outside to be a totally self-interested personal goal, you know, what really gets to the, the, the core of their motivation very often at its deepest level is some sense that what they're doing is beyond the self. Now you could say they're delusional, but it's, it's certainly their own a sincere account, right? So, so um, I think this desire is, you know, part and parcel of, you know, frankly, the human um, experience. I think it's um, something that we all recognize. And a lot of people who don't like their work, who feel burnt out, who feel aimless, it, you know, what they're missing, I think, is, you know, a sense of being part of something larger than themselves and in service uh, yeah. to, to something larger than themselves. Yeah. I, I wish we had time to talk about um, your conversation about Aristotle's eudaimonic happiness and hedonic happiness. That's that I really love that kind of conversation. And the you should way have you Marty Seligman bring, come on the show. I would love to have Marty Seligman. Yeah, would you send me an me email to? and I'll introduce you. That would be great. That'd okay. be great. A another thing you point out in this chapter uh, on on purpose is the way in which different people can have the same occupation, yet their subjective experience of that work differ drastically and thus contribute or not to their sense of purpose and thus to their grit. Uh, this, that, that, I just find that so helpful. Describe that to us. You know, you can be the bricklayer, you know, the, you know, the parable of the bricklayer the, who, who's laying bricks, you know, you could be the bricklayer who's building a church and you could be the bricklayer who's building the house of God. Um, and, and I think those are, you know, three ways that you can think about any work. I'm now thinking about the work of Amy Rosniewski, um, who's um, uh, at Yale um, and she, you know, was studying callings, um, hmm. you know, from her earliest days as a researcher and finding, you know, to her surprise that it wasn't like some professions are callings and other professions are merely careers and still yeah. other professions are just jobs, right? Because these are the kind of the three ways right. of thinking about work. Um, but really the same profession, say, for example, being a, an aide in a hospital, for, for one person, it could be a job, makes money, pays the bills. Another, it's a career. You know, if I progress, like I will get promoted. I can see the, you know, the the sort of trajectory, and yeah. the last is the calling, right? Uh, this is this is a uh, you know beyond my own. Um, personal gain. I'm part of something larger than myself. And I find the word calling, and again, I'm, you know, really referring to other scholars' work here, but but it's so interesting because it 
it is the it is the phrase that comes to mind, and of course yeah. it has very religious connotations. Um, uh, uh, and whether you're religious or not, it has a kind of spiritual dimension. You feel yeah. like someone or something is calling you to do so. You've been chosen to do some, this. Some sort of transcendent purpose or it's self-transcendent yeah. yeah and i think that's the key to be on the self-purpose right it's yeah. it's self-transcendent so so i guess the uh, most important um insight at least in my mind uh, of this is that it's not a feature of the of the job itself it's how you you know bring yourself to it and how you think yeah. of it um and i think if i um could summarize you know you know a very large number of conversations with leaders. Um, what, what their constant task is is to make the purpose more salient um, on an everyday basis because it is hmm. easy to get separated from the larger purpose right. of your work as you, you know, grind through your to do list and you manage all the problems that come up. And and I think this you know, reminding of the beyond the self purpose is you know a task for leaders and of course it's a a task for each of us. Um, and yeah. People have different practices for doing that, but I think that is um, that is important. Yeah. Uh, let's mention briefly the the final care, uh, psychological trait you point to hope. Um, and again, you you point to different kinds of possibilities of hope there. Yeah my uh, my PhD advisor uh, uh, was I should say is because he's still alive. But anyway, Marty Seligman. Um, and his work on optimism um, was um, uh, really world changing. I mean, you know, he's uh, somebody who started out studying animals and then, you know, depressed individuals. And what he found is that, you know, when you are confronted with adversity that is uh, beyond your control, you know, in these um, animal experiments, these, um, you know, dogs say would be subjected to um, mild but painful and scary electric shock that they had no control over. It just happens, you know, randomly. Um, and those dogs would soon basically look like depressed people look, you know, it's like mm -hmm. no energy, not getting up, you know, and given the opportunity to actually remove themselves from shock by like just walking across the cage, like they would just sit and, you know, be despondent. Um, and what Marty came to discover is that optimism um, is really the, the the photo negative of that, right? And some of the dogs in these experiments actually never gave up, you know, <laughs> just, mm. you know, adversity would happen, they couldn't control it. But then when given the opportunity, they would, you know, spring into action. Yeah. And I think what Marty might say about, um, you know, what underlies that hope, and this is very consistent with what Carol Dweck at Stanford um, has studied in, in terms of growth mindset. Um, it, it is a way of seeing the world um, wh where you, you're fun fundamentally assuming that um, there's something you can do. You know, yeah. there, there's got to be, so I can't change everything. You know, I can't change what my mother did. I can't change what my father did. I can't change my zip code um, maybe right now. Um, but, you know, you can change, you know, something. And um, when, I, when I talk about this in my uh, classes with my undergraduates, I say to them, I remember teaching during the pandemic and of course, it was a dark time for um, a lot of us. And um, I said, you know, there's so much you can't change. You know, you can't, you know, yourself personally decide when the vaccines are going to come out and, you know, what the, you know, schedule is going to be for classes and, you know, what, what your neighbors are going to do. But you know what you can do? You could like text your mom right now and tell her like that you love her. Like, can you do that? Like you have the power to do that. Like you could smile like in the next, like, I, is that under your control? You could do that. Like you could do a five minute favor. Um, uh, like everybody do a five minute favor, you know? And like at first students were like, oh, I, I can't think of anything, but you know, it takes less than five minutes to then think of something. You're like, yeah. oh wait, I could wash the, I guess I could wash the dishes for my roommate. Like, yeah, you can do that. So I think this idea of hope and optimism and a mindset that assumes that, you know, things can be changed, at least some things can be changed yeah. um, in some ways. I think that is something, frankly, Lee, I, I, I have to sometimes remind myself of, because mm -hmm. I think um, when you're not in that place, it's, it's hard sometimes to get there. Um, but, but I do think it's possible to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I find the phrase, uh, uh, two phrases helpful from Marty's work, uh, learned helplessness versus learned optimism. And that we can we can practice and work on these things as well. Uh, Absolutely. Of, of how we, how we frame things. Uh, you uh, very uh, in sixty seconds. Uh, I, it seems that you already answered this in what you just said last. But as I was reading your book, I it occurred to me that I wondered if some people would say, "Well, what do you do with 
the serenity prayer, right? Which which is saying, God grant me the serenity to, to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can. Now, I think would what you just said kind of be one way you would point to an answer in that regard? <laughs> well, I know we're toward the end of our conversation, Lee, but I'm smiling because um, that is the book I'm supposed to be writing right now. Um, in <laughs> really? other words, uh, when I stopped you know, well, when I stopped, when I finished writing Grit, I swore up and down that I would never write another book. And then I changed my huh. mind um, a few years ago because I thought, well, somebody has to write a book about the power of your circumstances, right? Because you yeah. can't, you know, always change them. Sometimes you can. So, and right. um, I looked into the Serenity Prayer, which of course is from um, uh, Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, right. you know, the great theologian, um, and and you know, it's become now adopted and and paraphrased, actually, frankly, in Alcoholics Anonymous right. uh, groups. But I think that um, I, I will say this: um, I think it is worth stating that some circumstances are actually beyond people's control. I think that should give us compassion. Um, we don't even know about their circumstances. You know, there's a, an expression misattributed to, to Plato, but I think beautiful, you know, um, each is carrying their own heavy burden. Um, so be kind to all you meet. Right. Yeah. And, and that is, uh, you know, words of wisdom to live by because some circumstances that are invisible to us are not changeable by the individual. And then the second line of the serenity prayer is like, the, you know, the courage to change the things Actually, in the original, it's that that need to be changed. I think that's yeah. the original wording, uh, but in the Alcoholics Anonymous version, it's like um, the courage to change the things I can. Um, but that, to me, was also worth a book. Like, you know, there's some circumstances that we can change. We don't think of circumstances in that way. We usually think of circumstances as beyond our control, right. but maybe we should look for those that are within our control. And yeah. then, of course, the wisdom to know the difference. So, so absolutely, right. more to say on that, but that would be a whole book, Lee. And so, um, since I haven't yet... Uh, figured out how to write such a book. We'll we'll have well, to we schedule forward. another we'll conversation that for that. <laughs> <laughs> so la last question in the last two minutes that we have, what would you point to as some successes and failures you've experienced yourself in living out what you prescribe in uh, your book, Grit? Well, I'm, I'm I'm more inclined to speak about the, the failures. So, you know, in terms of successes, I think, um, you know, figuring out eventually that I wanted to be a psychologist who writes a lot. Um, you know, like the, the, the teenager who went to summer school and studied psychology and writing grew up to be a psychologist who writes a lot. You know, that's been, you know, incredibly gratifying for me. Um, cause I am really not the smartest person in the room. I will, I will, I will, I will tell you with, you know, not false modesty, like, oh yeah, I'm definitely not. Um, <laughs> uh, I had to take an IQ test, like on the air with Steve Levitt and Stephen Dubner once. And I was like, oh my. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> the bronze medalist among the three of us, I will just say. Um, but but that uh, but that has been successful for me, you know, doing something that I really do love. The failure is what I just want to end with. You know, this has been a really hard year for me because I did try to write this second book and I've been struggling to figure out how to write it. And it's it's been um, just very like confidence uh testing and mm. um and and so i guess i want to say this like i think if i could say one thing it's like even if you study you know these things and you know you're you're on a path, like, don't expect it to be, uh, you know, linear. I mean, even Angela Duckworth wakes up some days and thinks like, that's a hell of it. Like, I just, yeah. I can't do it. It's too hard. <laughs> um, but, um, but I, I do want to say that I've, I've tried to remind myself of all the things that we've talked about in this conversation. And, um, you know, I haven't given up yet. Yeah. I've been talking to Angela Duckworth, professor at the University of Pennsylvania on her number one New York Times bestseller, Grit, The Power of Passion, and perseverance. Thank you, Angela. It's been a delightful conversation. Lee, I look forward to our next one. Thank you. Hey there, quick favor. We're conducting an audience survey. We would be really grateful if you could take just a few minutes and answer our survey. Please visit survey.prx.org slash no small endeavor. That's survey.prx.org slash no small endeavor. Would love it if you'd go take that survey today. Thanks. My thanks to all the Stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriot Harmon, Jason Sheasley, Ellis Osborne, and Tim Lauer. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is a production of PRX. 
Tokens Media LLC and Great Feeling Studios. Oh.